Zoni, I thought that was an excellent talk. Thank you. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, your uh, guidelines when they come out because they'll be very helpful. But you talked about how diabetes was a kind of promoter of sarcopenia, and I, I, I didn't actually see it. I don't, do we have any data that equally obese people I with diabetes have less, more sarcopenia than those who are obese without diabetes? I think you're right. This is an important point. Uh, there is not a lot of evidence, uh, because I think that the questions uh, have not been the focus of many studies. This kind of question has not been uh, investigated, at, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, I am not a diabetologist. Actually, I, I was by training, but then I did other things. And um, uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, probably uh, implications in my talk that uh, obese people have this kind of risk. There is evidence there. Uh, there is all the reasons to suspect that people with uh, diabetes uncontrolled or to some extent with the, with the with the more intense metabolic alterations that characterize diabetes at the same level of obesity, let's say, they might have even more chances of becoming uh, sarcopenic, whatever that means, because also in terms of sarcopenia, we need to really better define and find more consensus. So it's a, it's a tricky question, but at, at this stage, I don't think that uh, there are many studies addressing this issue, and you are right on that. Okay, thank and Dr. Mechanic, again, thanks very much for your talk. I, I was wanted to, to ask you about your kind of um, idea of diabetes. Is you know you had the four stages. Your first one was insulin resistance, and I have always thought that um, impaired beta cell function is part of that, or it could be the first thing. And I just wondered what your thoughts about that are. Thanks for not making it a math question. <laughs> um, so actually, it's a great question because in the process of putting this together, we all learned a lot about this. Um, I was corrected by Vivian Fonseca, actually, when we created the draft because um, insulin resistance was overlapping with prediabetes. But insulin resistance really, that state, that insulin resistance syndrome, which was really our first um, position paper on the topic, does not have the abnormal uh, glycemic metrics. So you actually have nothing biochemical other than HOMA and, and insulin resistance. You don't see elevation in fasting blood sugar. You don't see post-challenge hyperglycemia. But it's the insulin resistance, which is the first uh, event. The next event would be some beta cell dysregulation. Early on, you see increased beta cell uh, activity to compensate for the insulin resistance and then later in later stages you see decreased beta cell function uh, whether it's apop apoptosis from glucotoxicity or a variety uh, of many molecular uh, <laughs> mechanisms but there's beta cell dysfunction as a result of insulin resistance occurring first now obviously there are going to be those who might uh, conjecture that there's an initial beta cell hit first in type 2 diabetes. So Jeff, just to correct your statement, in fact, I think it should really incorporate um, not only insulin resistance. I think based on the data now, some of the genome scan data, insulin resistance, we don't know exactly when it occurs. And it also occurs up and down. So if you look at some of the uh, GM9 mutations that have been identified for type 2 diabetes, majority or that survive in, uh, genome-wide significance, majority of those are actually sort of like suggested of like some of those transcription factors and whatnot, all indicate is there's a predispositions of genetic defects in the beta cell uh, in, in the insulin secretion. So the, uh, that's not a math question. Yeah, right. Um, so I don't think that's inconsistent with what we're saying. And it also, you're getting to the nitty gritty of, of um, the definition of what beta cell dysfunction is. It, is beta cell dysfunction a biochemical detectable abnormality, um, or is it the appearance of a polymorphism or a mutation that could exist without that biochemical uh, or physiologic abnormality? We're defining it functionally in terms of a physiologic abnormality. Um, so the, the genome-wide genome um, association studies are no doubt going to be finding a lot of these uh, genomic 
uh, abnormalities, but the question is how relevant are they to an actual beta cell dysfunction later on. Uh, the theory is that the beta cell dysfunction is unmasked in the setting of insulin resistance and uh, is probably not clinic as clinically relevant in the absence of insulin resistance. So, sorry, so I, and I'm talking about, we were trying to identify, we screened for people with IGT for, and to do a clinical study. And uh, so these people did have abnormal glucose, and you mentioned. But I was blown away. We did FSI GTTs on them, and one third of them, the reason they were high glucose, because their insulin secretion was, was very, very low. They were, they were insulin sensitive, totally overlapped with normal. Their insulin secretion was low. And that's why they had. And I think that's the gray area that we need to de devise. But the purpose of, of reclassifying this, and it, this is really a first attempt at doing it, it'll, it'll get refined as the science starts to um, inform this model, is that you're really looking at the same disease just in different stages. And it's not serving us well to uh, conceive of type 2 diabetes as something that's different from prediabetes or insulin resistance. Uh, and also ABCD, adiposity-based chronic disease, and DBCD, dysglycemia-based chronic disease, are probably intersecting at that insulin resistance or beta cell defect area. That's, that's actually the, the stage that we need the most data on, that we need to understand better. So I think this interaction highlights that we just don't understand what's going on in that very, very early stage. I don't want to break into the Tom and Simon debate, um, but you finished. Thanks. <laughs> but I, I must say, I do like to think that uh, people eat too much, they, they get insulin resistance, and then a whole lot of things finish after that. But one of the philosophical things that I just wanted to, to, to ask, um, it, it, it might be, be interesting, we, we've had a debate just, just before lunch Will the polypill um, actually take over? Uh, the polypills are biologics. I mean, biologics like canakinumab and, uh, and, and, and PCSK9, um, along with the, with the new diabetes drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, perhaps with a little touch of thiazide diuretic and a few other things, you know, with the aspirin. Um, we, we can build up a nice um, portfolio, as it were, of, of drugs with the polypill. Will we, will we be able to defend our turf those of us who are still in lifestyle, um, when the polypill, the, the, the super polypill plus biologic injection once every six months comes along. I, I'll turn this over to others, but let me just make a brief comment, only because I, I work with Valentin Fuster, who's a big you know, advocate for, for the polypill. You have to consider where this concept came from. I mean, the polypill is coming from a background, a context, where you have an environment that, um, doesn't have the resources. Um, it's a wash across all societies that we do miserably and, and we're pathetic in terms of uh, structured lifestyle intervention. So that's certainly not, poverty isn't an excuse for not having structured lifestyle intervention. But not having the resources is what instigated the, the movement to have a polypill at a population-based setting. So it's within that framework that I would then answer the question, no, I don't think it's going to put us out of business. No, I don't think it's going to supplant any efforts to intensify lifestyle. Um, I, I would tend to be an optimist. Gabriele. Gabriele Riccardi, Naples, Italy. Uh, I would like to, to, to ask Rocco about this uh, paper, very, very interesting, which I really uh, support in relation to the, the diagnostic part and the, the background. What, what I have some doubts about is a recommendation about protein. Uh, th this is a very, uh, think, very, very difficult issue because uh, we come from experience in, in, in the field of first lipid recommendation where we considered lipids all together, then we realized that in, in fact, lipids are very different one from the other and uh, some should be recommended to be increased, but some others should be reduced. Now we are learning more about carbohydrates and we know that they are not all together. Now I think we have some indication that also in relation to protein, the issue can be very similar because 
for instance, we, there are many data showing that increasing meat consumption is associated with a, an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So even in elderly people, probably uh, increasing too much the consumption of, of meat, and that's one of the, the, the things that uh, elderly people find easier to consume because it's very easy to cook and to prepare, while vegetable foods are more difficult to get. But I'm not so sure that increasing the consumption of meat, uh, even in, in people who, are, uh, who have this uh, uh, sarcopenia, is the answer. Probably the, the, there should be more uh, vegetable proteins. Probably even within the animal <coughs> proteins, uh, the dairy proteins can have some advantage over the others. So I think that altogether, to give a, a number and say one gram protein per kilogram protein weight is a bit, uh, I mean, simplistic approach. We should be more, uh, more uh, detailed. I know it's not easy. We probably we don't have the knowledge to say exactly how to transfer this recommendation, but probably we, we need to uh, discuss a little bit more about that. No, I, I agree with you and thank you, thank you Gabriele for this uh, comment and question because of course my uh, couple of slides uh, including some protein uh, say uh, statements were not meant to be a recommendation and definitely if anything not an across the board recommendation for everyone. We, we are aware that there are some studies that actually are not very successful even when we try to implement some hyperproteic uh, there, are, there is uh, evidence that uh, eating low protein is a, a risk factor for losing muscle mass. And that's, uh, uh, as, as in many other cases occurs, reversing this statement by treating with, with the opposite is not, is not easy. And I agree with you that we probably need to face uh, what I, I like to call the challenge of complexity, that there is no one size fits all. On the other hand, there are some uh, very frail uh, individuals, some, some uh, uh, clinical contexts, and also I would like to emphasize the, the, uh, the context of uh, medical nutrition, where you can uh, modulate the, the, the composition of your, of your formulae. Sometimes there, you, probably there is some room for, for uh, improvement and maybe going a little bit higher. But I agree with you, we need, the problem is ideally we would need a number of studies under you know, different clinical conditions to optimize our, our goal to go with the pharmaconutrition and not just uh, recommendations. Yes, please. Hi, I have a quick question for, oh sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to make a comment, I'm going to put on my critical care nutrition hat for a second. The 2 and the 2.5 came from ESPN. From, uh, and this is probably in the, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is probably in the context of the critically ill uh, patient. This is not for the non-critically ill patient with diabetes. Yeah. And Paul Wishmeyer's work um, has probably propelled this concept where the driver that seems to, the, the classifier that seems to have the most statistical correlation with outcome is nitrogen. Uh, in the uh, critically ill patient with diabetes or even obesity and not non-protein calories. Uh, there's also precedent for 2.5. The precedents are, are those patients on hemodialysis uh, in the ICU that you can uh, continue to, to get reward by escalating nitrogen up to 2.5 cal uh, grams per kilo per day. But I think the question is a good question for those non-critically ill patients no, with diabetes. Thanks for stressing this out because if it was not clear due to the fact I was going a little fast in the end of the presentation, but that was one uh, guideline for critically ill patients, obese critically ill patients. And I have to say that these numbers are kind of uh, well debated and not, not really. And the evidence behind that is also, but uh, I wanted to stress the point that there is a, a lot of discussion about increasing uh, the allowance, the recommendations for protein, in, amino acids intake in, in this case. And so this is an issue that we will have to face uh, uh, if we want to address this question of, of malnutrition in, uh, in diabetes and obesity. Just, just one other clarification. In the ICU, it's in terms of, you, you brought it up, it's really amino acid, uh, which is very different than the, the number for protein like for parenteral nutrition. And then the other um, precedent is for burn patients. Burn patients, you can go up to 2.5 or even higher. So this is teaching me too, too many things. I, I wanted to compress the message too much. Okay.
Yeah, we have four comments to comment. The first one, please. Okay. One quick question for Ariana, actually. Uh, you may have mentioned this, so apologies if I missed it, but did you monitor physical activity in the subjects? Because um, it was very interesting to see a significant increase in HDL. How do you explain that? Yes, we did. Um, so they have self-report data on physical activity. And I didn't show this, but um, the people who were most adherent to the mural placements were most adherent to almost everything. So they were attending a lot of more visits. Um, they were exercising more. And they were sticking to their calorie goals as more. So that might be the result of more physical activity. Vlad, please. I have a quick one. Uh, I just want to ask Ariana Chao because nobody asks you a question now if you interrupt your silence. Uh, I really look ahead to your look ahead presentation. Doesn't make sense. Anyway, uh, you know, what I want to ask you, people, I'm not expert in, in, in obesity, but I do good weight so, law study, number one. Uh, tell me, you know, you, you give this supplement. If you do this again, look ahead, look behind, uh, would, you, would you still go with supplement or how this could be done effectively maybe with alternate fasting compared to constant fasting that you are doing. You know, one day nothing, other day something, but you, are, you have total fasting. Um, I think that um, is an interesting question. I don't know if alternate fasting has been um, examined in people with type 2 diabetes or not, but I'd be concerned about hypoglycemia as well as them being able to um, incorporate physical activity uh, without having low blood sugars, um, but uh, perhaps among people who didn't, weren't at risk for hypoglycemia. David, please. Just a quick one for Rocco. Insulin is an anabolic hormone, so it's no surprise that we lose protein uh, when insulin action isn't good. If we've got resistance to branched-chain fatty acids, which we have in muscle, um, in, in, in insulin-resistant states. Do we have, have we come to a stage where we may be getting hormone replacement for uh, long-term sarcopenia? Is that going to be part of it, so that we use the steroid hormones as well as insulin um, to prevent yeah, this? Is that, because the, I'm just worried, the, Gabriele mentioned the, the, the protein story, and I think it's a, it's a problematic one. And the long-term studies that have looked at longevity on high protein diets have not been good. So I think that one has a, a big caveat there. I'm wondering whether we should be thinking of perhaps alternative ways. Well, my, my point on protein, again, just thank you for the question to, to further, uh, let's say, uh, specify some of the points. Again, protein is, uh, is a complex issue. But on the other hand, I think that uh, it is one of the possible treatments. I think we cannot, we cannot uh, just, just erase it or delete it from, from the panel of, of potential uh, treatments. I think we need to find the optimal conditions and the optimal patients that can benefit from, from uh, uh, moderate or, or a less moderate increase in protein intake. Uh, coming to the hormonal treatments, of course, this is another possibility. Again, probably the best targets would be patients with a proven deficiency. Uh, the geriatric population, for instance, and that may have some, uh, some uh, already uh, insufficient uh, or, or physiologically or pathologically deficient signaling. I am afraid that also in this, uh, there was no time, of course, to go through all these things, but I'm afraid that there are also some, some potential issues uh, from some studies out there uh, about, uh, about these treatments. We need to find uh, the optimal doses, the optimal timing. The, again, not easy. Uh, I agree it's a potential uh, approach. I think we have um, uh, the only way probably to, uh, to really uh, uh, overcome uh, this problem or limit this problem would be a multimodal uh, approach. I don't think we have a one, uh, uh, one single treatment, like diabetes, I guess. <laughs> so I think that for malnutrition in obesity and diabetes, we need a multimodal approach. Exercise cannot be uh, emphasize, overemphasized. It's, it's so crucial and, again, uh, something that we need to keep in, in consideration because it will enhance the effect of any other treatment, which is so important. But thank you for, for bringing this up. And the last question or comment. Um, thanks a lot. Um, there are many things to say after these comments. Perhaps just very short about protein. 
think most intervention studies show positive effects of high protein diets in people with diabetes from the Australian groups, Clifton groups, from our group and from many others. The epidemiology is very opposed to the outcomes of the intervention studies actually. And I think a lot of work has to be done about correcting for behavioral factors because people eating plant protein usually have a philosophy behind it and behave differently. But coming back to the look ahead study and weight loss diets, um, I was part of the Diogenes study and like many other studies, we had fantastic weight loss. Most of our studies are why people regain weight. We had another study, Maintain, where people first lost 15 kilograms. I think weight loss is not the problem. The problem is regaining. And one of the fantastic things in the Look Ahead study is that even the control group lost a lot of weight after a couple of years. And my interpretation was always they probably got a lot of public attention in that study. And when people realized they were in the weight loss group and supposed to die, it had a massive psychological impact to push people to actually maintain the weight. In the Diogenes study, people easily lose 10 kilograms. They maintain that over a year or two. If you look after four years, all the positive effects are lost. And I think this is the, the general experience. And uh, I very much like Jeff's approach, and I think it's, it's fantastic to have these transcultural diabetes nutrition algorithms but their success, I think, has the same problem. And then you come to David's poly pill. I think the, the solution to actually to obesity will in the end be pharmacological. I don't see how we overcome that sort of psychological thing, except perhaps the look ahead study. What is your explanation for the weight loss? Um, so we don't exactly know what happened in the control group. Um, one hypothesis um, is that there, as they were getting older, they were actually losing lean muscle mass, and that's why they started to um, have more weight loss going on since they weren't exercising as much. But is that uh, also, just to follow up on that, what then, when you, you could stratify according to age, do you see that some sort of like uh, differences in your data? Did, did Lover have to do that? I believe they did. I'm, I'm, I believe there was a difference, but I'm not positive about that. But that's a, I'll have to look that up. Okay, thank you. I think it's close to time. The uh, time to close the session. Very, uh, thank you very much for the lively discussion.